I would never have stood before people and uh, been able to do it very easy. It's just hard for me to do that. Just not the, I guess I wasn't gifted in that. But uh, I do enjoy God's Word, uh, studying it. But just like about everybody else, it always stand improvement studying it. When he asked me that, I mean, I hadn't I started, I already picked the subject out, but I hadn't prepared it. And, uh, you know, but I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> but anyway, he asked me the other day, and so I said I would. And it's still the same subject that I wanted to talk about, but it, uh, I know I always tend to be, I feel different sometimes. And uh, from a lot of people or whatever, I have maybe my way of thinking is different. But uh, sometimes I see things a little differently. Sometimes we we'll talk about it and various things and kind of bounce things off of one another. But uh, and I don't mean to come forward as I'm knowledgeable, especially in this subject. I'm not knowledgeable, but some things have struck me over the years that God has shown me where I needed to change my perspective on it. And uh, it came from talking to a man once who went through, uh, I was putting a door in for him out here at Gordon, and he, his uh, family, he lost his family in a car wreck. And it hadn't, it wasn't that long ago and at that time. And I remember trying to be do the Christian thing and console him in a way, you know, try to be Christian and lift him up give him hope or whatever. And I was just like I am right now, fumbling over words to say, and he, he just stopped me and says, don't worry about it. And he said, everybody has come to me, everybody you can imagine, and said everything they can say to me. And there's not going to be anything you're going to say to me that's going to be any different. And it hasn't helped. That's good. So and he was nice, wouldn't agree to me or anything like that. And sometimes, uh, uh, well, from that time on, it made me think how to answer that a little bit more directly. And I still don't. But I want to just ask you a question, just start out right here in front here. I want to ask you if you could pick one word that you believe best describes God of all of his attributes. What would that one word be? Somebody can give me a word. Love. Love. Mercy. Mercy. Y'all okay. no, pretty much in agreement. Grace. Grace. There's a lot of attributes, aren't there? I mean, we go on and on and on. But love is usually the, the first one. And, and that's correct. Because 1 John 4 8 says, <coughs> That he's God of love. God is love. Right? So, I man, it's scriptural, that's right. And a lot of times the world looks at God as a God of love. I mean, if they've been taught that by Christians or whatever, and that's good. But whenever there's catastrophes or some kind of you know bad thing to happen to them or happen to do whoever, they want to always say, and I've heard this a hundred times, that, you know, if there is a God out there, he's a God of love, why does he allow bad things to happen? You know, there's answers for that. Sometimes they're not pleasant answers. But why would God allow a baby to be born, deformed, you know, that has to be supported in life support. And things. I don't understand all things. We don't have the exact answers. We may think we have something to say. Just sometimes it's just not a real good answer. But uh, one of my first things that I try to remember in my own life, and I don't know where I got it, I guess the way I do, from God's Word. When bad things happen, You know, we don't blame God for it. With, I always say, 
I deserve a lot for it. We deserve a hellfire. But because God loves us so much, He gave His own Son to down the cross to pay for our sin, to give us eternal life. Just if we would simply in faith come to Him. We deserve it. We deserve hellfire. We also we live just in an imperfect world. And that's because of sin. Thanks to Adam and Eve, of course, through Satan deceiving Eve, Adam and Eve. But sometimes bad things are just going to happen because Jesus even said that in this life there shall be tribulation. And, and I don't understand this one so much, but even God says in His Word that sometimes judgment or punishment would come to the offspring of you know, the, your offspring. He says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, and that's in the uh, uh, Ten Commandments, he says, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. I don't know how that applies today. I don't know if God still does that. I guess He does. Somebody can correct me. But sometimes we go through things, possibly, that God has a reason for things in the past. I don't understand it. That's all I can say. But if God said it, I believe it. Whatever God does, it's right. Amen. Whatever God does, it's perfect. And He knows exactly what is best for us. And we can count on that. But no one wants to ever hear that maybe sometimes we just flat out deserve it. You know, we, we, we see things like what's happened down here with the hurricanes, what's happening as we speak. You know, we've got friends down there, we have relatives maybe, we have churches down there that we're aware of, and we say, you know, why would God allow that to happen? Well, God's reason is perfect. But sometimes I can't help but think, and this is where I don't mean to be negative or anything like that. If anybody so don't take it, <laughs> this is generally speaking, that maybe our as churches, we're, our level of spirituality, spiritual temperature is nowhere near what we think it is sometimes. And I can tell you, for me myself, uh, I've seen that so much. I've seen, God has shown me me really well over the years. I'm glad he has. Because I definitely, looking back on it, I can see where I need to change. And he has broken me in many ways. And that's, <clears throat> and I'm glad. But sometimes, I think, because most of my life in church, I really thought that I was A-OK. -okay, that uh, I was doing all the right things. Going to church every time you can think of. But I knew my heart wasn't. It was far away from God. I wasn't looking at God in the way that I should look at Him. And I think sometimes, you don't take this wrong, and this is where we can differ or whatever, but I think sometimes we as Baptists, even independent Baptists, we, we rely upon God's grace and God's grace is marvelous, wonderful we sing about it we rest in that and we, we have the thoughts of you know, God has forgiven me of my sins, my past, present and future and sometimes we kind of relax in that and at, at the end of the day you know, we might say a prayer and then quickly toward the end we usually add and forgive us of our sins and you know in Jesus' name, amen. And I think that we kind of are looking at, is looking at God out of the perspective the way maybe the world does. That God is this God of love, which is true, God of mercy and grace, forgiveness, all those attributes. But God is so much more than that. One of the attributes we usually add in that mix is he's a holy God, right? He's holy. But I think we misuse that as well. 
Because God's holiness, that encompasses all of his attributes. So his love is holy love. God's mercy is holy mercy. His love, his grace is holy grace. His word is holy. You know, his spirit is holy. His church is holy. His people are holy. On down the line, holy encompasses all of that. So to me, the one word, if, you, if you're going to choose one word, not change because I've always said God is God of love, but He is a holy, holy God. Amen. Another reason we might experience, uh, well, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 26. Talking about God's judgment and what it does. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 7, 8, and 9. We're going to be in Isaiah here for quite a while. Isaiah 26 says, The way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost thus weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. Now why is this so? And it gives us a reason. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Sometimes God will allow things to come in our lives, as horrendous as it may be, because He's trying to teach us something. He's trying to draw us back to Him. Sometimes we have to be broken. Just understand this principle. I mean, if you're going to come to God, it's going to be through humility and brokenness, a contrite spirit. It's not going to be in a haughty, proud, arrogant way. And just sometimes it takes God's judgment directly. I think if we would look at God from the perspective of His holiness, how great His holiness is, it would help us <coughs> to live a little bit differently for Him. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6. And this is where Isaiah is commissioned. And every time I read this, it just makes me feel dirty. Okay? It makes me feel inadequate. Verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That had to be a pretty amazing sight for him to see. <clears throat> Isaiah, <clears throat> when he saw this, he commissioned it and he goes on and says, who will go uh, for me? He said, here am I, I'll do it. 
He did not come before God with the attitude, wow, I must be adequate. God chose me to do this job. But his first response was, woe is me. I am undone. When he saw the holiness of God, and when he saw these seraphims with the six wings flying, the two wings were covering their face to their feet, and they were saying one to another, holy, holy, holy. He saw that here I am just a mere man. And here these seraphims are perfect creatures without sin. And look how they show such awesome respect and honor to the great Almighty God. How have I this to shown disrespect, dishonor, rudeness, crudeness before my God? He began to see those things, I believe. When I read that, how holy God is, it makes me feel like so many times in my life as I thought I was something and I wasn't. But God is blessed by me. I don't go everywhere I'm saying that. But almost that spirit thinking because I did this, 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 that God is so pleased with me. You know, anytime we ever come into the presence of our holy God, we should be humble. When we open His holy word, we should be humble about it and respectful. We, when we come to, we say, God's house. We say, God is here. And we say, His Holy Spirit is here. Jesus lives in our heart. So on and so forth. We should come with the utmost respect, utmost fear of Him. Something that <clears throat> Kenneth did this morning, and he called it just like that, and it impressed me, because it's right. And I've done the same thing too, but we was talking about, and it's kind of made a little joke, you know, Arkansas, you know, then about, then he said, I, I should have said, said that. You know, <laughs> that is, that is exactly good. That's right. That's showing total respect for God's Word. Too many times we have jokes. I've heard jokes about God and I've laughed my head off. Some of them just plumb funny. But I'll tell you what, that's something I don't want to ever be a part of anymore. If you got any God jokes, don't tell me. I don't want to know. But I think that's something that we as Christians should stay away from. And if the world comes up to us, has some joke. Matter of fact, I've some guys they say, I got a joke to tell you. I say, don't have anything in there about God. They say, oh, no, that's a clean joke. Well, God's clean, but don't, I don't want anything about God in there. Uh, no dirty joke. But the world don't think anything about it. And sadly, sometimes Christians don't think about it too. You know, it might be just a clean little joke and has something about God. That is such dishonor and disrespect, I believe. And I'm going to treat it such from here on out. Uh, I want to read a verse here. Hosea uh, chapter 11 verse 9 says, I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee. He is the Holy One. He is holy, holy, holy. How many times have you ever heard anybody say, well, the old man upstairs. You know, pray to him. You know, that is. Oh, that's bad. We should never be. I have said that for times in my ignorance and stupidity. And uh, it's one of those things God has taught me, changed me. Habakkuk one, verse twelve and thirteen says, "Art not thou from everlasting, O Lord, my God?" Mine, Holy One, Thou art purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. 
God is so holy that He doesn't even want to see sin. You remember Jesus upon the cross when He bore our sins and He turned away? I mean, His own Son who was being obedient to Him, doing what He wanted Him to do because He loved mankind, at that moment He turned away because of the sins that Jesus was bearing on the cross. Our sins. God cannot accept it. And I think that we as Christians need not so much, we should not take sin lightly. Uh, we do sin. I'm going to cover some things that I am guilty of. And I think that maybe as a church as whole, churches together, we are all guilty of because we live in this land today here, which facilitates a lot of that. Let's look at, uh, let's turn to Revelation chapter 1 and see how John felt after he saw, got a glimpse of God's glory. Revelation 1. And I'm just going to start in verse 12 for sake of time. <clears throat> he said, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, which was Jesus. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars out of, the, out of his mouth, went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. When he saw God's wonderful, marvelous, holy glory, it was too much for him to be contained. He passed out. He fainted. Just like, as if the person was dead. He was not moving. If God were to manifest himself to us that way, I think every one of us in here, I don't know, we'd all pass out tonight. We would be on our faces with such fear. We would tremble. But it would be a respectful fear of who He is, the marvelous God that He is, that He would even manifest Himself that way to us. But here, they got a glimpse of that, and we see what it did to them. Turn to, to chapter 4 there. Revelation. And I'll just start in verse 6. You can read the whole thing and just see the, the respect that's given. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts and each of them had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him, that sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for Thou hast created all things and for Thy pleasure they were, they are and were created. God is such a holy God and I think that is the attribute that maybe we should focus on when we think about God. When we go to Him in prayer, we ought to think about His holiness. When we come to God's house, we ought to think about His holiness. That will control a lot of our demeanor or maybe sometimes 
you know, I'm the biggest clown on the planet, but I clown way too much, and sometimes I'll, I'll just do it I'm, without thinking. And then I catch myself and I just need to shut up. Anyway, not only is God holy, God wants us to be holy, okay? And uh, let's, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, he wrote, and he said, to Christians, by the way, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And that was, he was quoting Leviticus 19 to you. For us to be holy, what does it mean? What do we do to be holy? Well, first and foremost, he's talking to Christians. We know that we are made holy by the blood of the Lamb, right? But after we are saved, we have a responsibility to maintain a perfect walk before the Lord as much as we possibly can. We are going to fail from time to time, but misery hits us pretty hard because of the Holy Spirit who lives within us and convicts us and we make it right. <clears throat> but we are to live a separated life. To be holy means to separate ourselves from the world. Worldliness. And I believe our churches today are affected by worldliness. I think that we're not even aware of it. I think that sometimes when we come in, this just a microcosm of example, when we come in the church, and I'm I'm guilty, we talk about everything but God. We ought, I mean, when we come in, we ought to be prepared to come into God's house to worship. And it's okay, I and mean, we have, there's some of you actually, if I'm ever around you, we get to talking about the Lord, because that's just in your nature. <laughs> that's an honorable thing. We should all be that way. When we're out in public, just sit and listen to people, watch their expressions. I like to do that a lot. And you think, do they ever have any concept of God whatsoever in their lives? Do they ever think about God? I mean, they're just talking, they're laughing. If you're in public, you're drinking, whatever, at a restaurant. And you can tell that God is nowhere near that table where they're at. But sadly, worldliness has worked its way, crept its way into our churches. We're focused more on this life sometimes than we are that life. You know, Jesus said to lay up treasures in heaven. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We focus too much here. Also, the cares of this life. In Matthew chapter 13, and I'll just read it because I've already got it written down. Just listen to it. Matthew uh, chapter 13, uh, verse 22, talking about the souls, the four souls. He <clears throat> said, uh, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. I think this is American Christianity to me from my perspective. We get caught up with the cares of this life, whether it comes from work, you know, at the end of the day we talk about our problems at work. You ever had a problem with it on a job? Someone mistreating your boss, you know, this or that, or at school or in our families. I can tell you, Tony and I have been going through some struggles with our daughter, uh, Melissa, and she has really just turned our world upside down and puts us on an emotional roller coaster ride. And it is just a point. It's like there is talking about it, and folks is so focused on it that we're trying to, I guess, solve it ourselves, and we're not going to. Her mother told her the other day, she says, Tony, you need to let it go and give it to God. That's the only thing that's going to fix this. Only one that's going to fix this. And that's so right. That's good advice for mom. 
But uh, one of the things we all, some of you are going through some things that uh, will rip your heart out. We can't let these things get us down. We need to turn over to God and let Him take care of it.
There's nothing wrong. I'm here. I do this. I pray a prayer. I ask God to forgive me my sins. Uh, so on and so forth. That's pretty much this lesson for today. That I don't. Just, I told you I'm not a orator. I can't speak well. But things bother me and bother me about me in my life. How I come before God in a unholy manner and disrespect Him. We should have such respect. We should have fear as the Bible many verses. And I had some of those. And I'm not going to read them because we need to get on out of here. But we should fear. We should tremble before the Lord God Almighty. For he is a great and loving God. He's done so much for us. We deserve hellfire. But he gave us eternal life through His precious Holy Son. And we thank Him for that. That's all I'll say. And you have two books, four pages of notes, and I was getting worried. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It does not matter. Thank you. I knew you could do that because he, he and I talked about that. And that's good. Yeah, I think we need to be very careful when we come to God's house. That we come in the right spirit. And uh, I see it, you know, you preaching, you can see who's listening, you can see who's bored, you can see who's not happy. But what gives you a message? You have to deliver it. And uh, just have to be faithful, but with the right spirit. I, I think performance is more important to us but spirit is more important to God. And that's what he was trying to say. And that's really very important. So, thank you, Brother <coughs> Thank you for coming back this afternoon. Did they stay away for you? Yeah, no, they always. Mr. Well, that's something you fell asleep on me. So don't, give, don't give me that pious stuff. <laughs> Yes, you. What? What? When you go like this, what does that mean? I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, Father, help us. <laughs> uh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. And I know it's hard about that. So, folks, we got a lot to pray about this week. Amen. Got to pray for our church. Uh, got to pray for each other. Got to pray for the sick. Got to pray for. Our leaders got to pray for you know when when they when they pass a 15 um, billion as an aid package and that's not even a drop in the bucket. Pow! What does your brain do? But I still say somewhere in all this, and we know it. This is what the Bible said. Somewhere in all this, God is speaking to our nation. And I'm not taking away from the people that are hurting and dying and losing loved ones and have lost everything. But somewhere in all this, God is speaking to our nation, folks. And we need to pray that the voice of God will be received. Bible plainly says he does speak to us in the storm. He does, folks. So, got a lot to pray about. God bless you. I, I just hope you have a wonderful week. Uh, be careful. Uh, God's grace be with you. For the mic, thank you. Thank you. Let's stand.